Can you hear me now? Yeah, sure. Yeah, is it coming out of the as well? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, we might as well make a start because it is just after 10 30. So, um, uh, let me first of all introduce myself. My name is uh, Morris Gleason. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to Bridget, the organizer, for inviting me to speak. And today I'm going to talk to you wonderful people about why DNA and how it is useful for helping you to research surnames. Uh, this is also being recorded for YouTube, so you'll get all the images and you'll get my voiceover and also the roar of the crowd and the smell of the grease paint when you uh, go to uh, YouTube. If you just Google DNA and family tree research, uh, you'll actually find my YouTube channel and this video will be up there in the next couple of days. So if you miss anything today, you can watch it again, and again, and again. <laughs> so, lots of fun. Um, why DNA? Let's uh, have a look. At, uh, there's also DNA testing available uh, later on this afternoon. So I've got about uh, 200 DNA kits with me. If anybody's interested in doing a DNA test, there will be those uh, kits available for this afternoon. Now, um, a lot of us doing our Irish family tree research have this kind of family tree. Um, there's me, there's my dad's uh, grandparents, great-grandparents. I've gone back to about 1800, uh, and then I kind of hit a brick wall with about half my, my ancestors, 1830 for the other half. And uh, that's after uh, exhausting all the usual resources such as the family lore, the letters in the, in the attic, the family bible, uh, the 1901 and 1911 censuses, before that Griffith's valuation, and all the cancelled books from the valuation office every two years thereafter, very, very helpful. Uh, we also have the birth, <coughs> marriages, and deaths, the civil registration, 1865 onwards from, for Catholics, or 1864 onwards from Catholics, uh, 1845 onwards for non-Catholics, and then the church records, which can go back into the 1700s, but most of them start around about 1800, 1830. So it's kind of potluck whether your particular area of interest is included in those church records. And then we also have a variety of other um, uh, sources like as newspapers, they really put the flesh on the bones of your family tree. Uh, for those with Dublin heritage like myself, Glasnevin Cemetery is a fantastic source of information. Uh, the electoral rolls are coming online as well. So there's a variety of bits of information, but you still have this brick wall around about the 1800 time point. The question is, how do you break through it? And that's what I'm going to talk to you today about how I used Y-DNA to break through one of my ancestral lines, this one here, uh, which is actually the Spiran line. And Spiran is particularly relevant to this area because they worked on the Adair estate. So I'm home. I've come home. <laughs> so um, that's... Uh, we, when I started researching the Spiran name, and just to show you how strangely it's spelt, S-P-I-E-R-I-N, very unusual, I thought, Looking at my ancestors, let me start with that particular name, because it's very unusual. It'll, that'll be an easy one to research. Um, so that's where I started with Spearing. But uh, the, I met Bob Spearing from New Jersey, who's uh, online a couple of years into my research, and he gave this incredible tale about how there are two old wills from Limerick in 1719, 1726, and from those, he was able to put together this draft family tree of these early Limerick Spearings. And they married into the Hartwell family. And the Hartwells were mayors of Limerick in 1676 and 1677. And they were granted land in Limerick by King Charles I for their services to the crown. And then Sir William Beatham, who was chief herald or Ulster King of Arms of Ireland back in the 1820s, he has a brief scrap of information about the Spirits that links them to a family of goldsmiths in London. And these goldsmiths, we've got tons of information about them, and they were associated, perhaps, with a group of spirits up in Cambridge, one of whom was granted a license to print by King Henry VIII and became one of the first printers of the Cambridge University Press. And they came originally from Flanders, and their best friend was Erasmus. <laughs> so my dad said, well, I might be related to them, but not you. <laughs> so this was a fantastic tale, but could be actually supported with documentary evidence. And so here were a variety of different researchers 
uh, in New Jersey, Ontario, Georgia, Australia, Ireland, all of them with different spellings of the surname. Spearing, Spearin, Spearin with two E's. Uh, the, the I and the A are, are turned around, and then there's a Sperrin over there as well. Could all of these different surname variations be related to each other? Nah, I don't think so. I had my doubts. I had my doubts. But what we did was, we reconstructed our various trees with the information we had. So this was one of the Ontario families here. There's the brick wall in red around about 1770. Um, here is Bob's one from New Jersey, ending in Luke in 1794. Here's one from Limerick, ending in 1833. And this one is on, in Australia in 1791. And then we have a couple of generations before we get to the early Limerick experience that we identified in those wills. And then we have the London ones, and then the Cambridge ones, and then back to Flanders. Could we go back to the 1400s? This was the tantalizing question. Um, one particular family was lucky, and that was because the, those people who married into the Hartwell family named their children Hartwell Spearin, Charles Hartwell Spearin, George Hartwell Spearin. And you can see this today in some of the families uh, that are, have, a, have some of the Spearin families living today. In their ancestry, there's a Hartwell there, there's another Hartwell there, and um, these are the uh, wills from uh, Matthew Spearin and Luke Spearin mentioning the Hartwells, and that's how we constructed the early uh, Limerick Spearins, and there you see Hartwell up there, a Hartwell Spearin up there. Another common name that was passed down in both families is Luke. So we have a Luke up there, we have a Luke over there as well, then we have a Luke down here, a Luke down here, a Luke over here, yes. So there's a lot of... Uh, evidence that actually links some of the Spearin families today with those early Limerick experience because of the presence of Hartwell as a forename. And the, the Hartwell as a forename is as rare as hen's teeth. In the US, they stopped recording Hartwell as a forename in 1967 because there have been fewer than four Hartwells as forenames since then. So that gives you an idea of how rare it is. So in all probability, 99.9% .9 probability, that Limerick family that actually has Hartwell today can go back to Hartwell back in the uh, late, early 1700s. And so he turns to DNA. Um, here's somebody swabbing their cheek uh, or spitting it into a test tube. That test tube then goes off to the lab in an envelope. And I have DNA kits here. We tested a few people already. Uh, they're going to post that envelope off to the, the estates tomorrow. And then when it gets to the lab, they look at your sample, they put it through the analyzing machine, and they post your results on your own dedicated web page with your username and password. So it's only so it's private password protected, you can see it, and uh, you can look at your results. Not only that, but they compare your results with everybody else in their database. And there are a million people who have done a DNA tests with Family Tree DNA, a million with 23andMe, and a million with Ancestry. And they compare your results with everybody else in the database, and they put a list of matches with their email addresses up on your web page. And then you can contact those people and say, hey, I see we're a DNA match. It looks like we might be related somehow. Do you want to compare family trees and see if we can sort out just exactly how we are, we are connected to each other? Um, the other great advantage of uh, family tree DNA is that you, they've actually created an infrastructure where you can start your own projects. So I run the Gleason project, the Farrell project, and the Spearin project on family tree DNA, and you gather people together who have the same interest in that surname. And uh, so, for example, with the Spearin, there's about 40 people in that group. With Gleason, there's about 107, and with Farrell, there's a lot more, about 170 or so. So it's a way of getting people together to research particular surnames. Now, Let's have a closer look at the DNA sample that you've given, because when you scrape your cheek, you're dislodging cheek cells into the, onto the swab. And then the swab goes into the test tube. In each cell in your body, you have approximately 6 billion DNA markers. And some of those markers are included in the mitochondria, those little blue things up there, uh, which are like the batteries of the cell, they give you energy. And that's called mitochondrial DNA. That's only passed on from mothers to their children. It's not passed on from fathers. So uh, your mitochondrial DNA, you got it from your mother, she got it from her mother, she got it from her mother, 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 going back 200,000 years. 
So it's very, very useful for tracing the direct female line back. But it's only one ancestral <coughs> line. Mother, 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 mother. In the nucleus of the cell, this little green blob up here, we have the 46 chromosomes arranged into 23 pairs. And the 23rd pair is also called the sex chromosomes. And they're called either X or Y. And with women, they get two X chromosomes. And with men, you get an X and a Y chromosome, and you end up looking like that. So, um, <laughs> yes. Uh, the Y chromosome is very short and stumpy. <laughs> the X chromosome is about three times larger, which basically means that the average woman is more of a person genetically than the average man. Hey. Hey. Yes, girl power. So those are the three types. Those are the types of DNA. The three major types of DNA tests then are the test for the Y DNA, which goes back along the father's 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 line because the Y-DNA is only passed from father to son. So that'll go back father, 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 father. On the other side, we have the mitochondrial DNA, which goes back mother, 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 on the direct female line. So with the Y-DNA and the mitochondrial DNA, you're just doing one ancestral line, and they're on the extremes of your family tree. One's on the direct male line, one's on the direct female line. The autosomal DNA, which is basically another word for all the other chromosomes, chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 22, and then the X chromosome. These uh, help you go back on all of your ancestral lines. All of your ancestral lines, but only about five, six, seven generations. So that would be the level of your four times great grandparents, and you've got 64 of those. So with the Y DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, you do one ancestral line. With the autosomal DNA, you do 64, roughly. Okay, so it's all of your ancestors. Now, um, the Y-DNA and the mitochondrial DNA are very, very good for deep and recent ancestry. So they will also, they're used for migration studies, and they study the pathway of human migration out of Africa 50,000 years ago was when the last major exodus out of Africa took place, um, and that's where, where present-day non-Africans were all derived from that group of humans that came out of Africa 50,000 years ago. But the reach of Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA actually goes back 200,000 years, maybe even 300,000 years for the Y-DNA. So very, very useful uh, for people who are studying human migration, uh, along with archaeology and linguistics. Um, when you get your Y-DNA results, you get uh, an array of markers, an array of numbers. It doesn't really make much sense on its own. You know, this marker here is this 460, four, and the value for that marker is 11 doesn't tell you very much. You only get, um, it only becomes useful when you start comparing your marker values with somebody else's marker values. And like I say, there are a million people in the database, so your values will com be compared with a million other people to see who you match or who you're close to. Um, it also tells you your Y-DNA haplogroup, which is just roughly, um, haplogroup is a group of people with a broadly similar genetic signature. So what you find in Western Europe, a uh, haplogroup or 1B is very, very common. Uh, it's, you hardly see it in China, okay? And it just means that as the humans came out of Africa, they developed little mutations and developed their own individualistic genetic signatures over the course of thousands and thousands of years. And that's why the genetic signature of the Irish doesn't look like the genetic signature of the Chinese, okay? And you can get down into finer and finer detail as time goes on. And that gives you an idea of the kind of migration patterns that people are able to um, research using this DNA. This is a list of my spear and matches. And I've obliterated the um, forenames just for privacy reasons. But you can see that I have quite a few people called Spiran who are matching me. Exactly, this is actually my third cousin because I'm a Gleason. I had to get my third cousin to do the test. You also see Mulligan, Manning, Mackenzie, Baxter. There's other people in there. These are people to whom I'm probably related before the time of surnames, so over a thousand years ago. Okay. Um, but this gives this is an, gives you an idea of what your results will look like when you get them. But the results, again, in themselves, they do tell you more than just looking at your own individual results. But you need to join a surname project to really start comparing your DNA with everybody else's. And this is an example of the Spearin project. Um, here's somebody up here, uh, one of the members of the group. We tested four people initially, 
uh, because you, you saw how many different variations of the surname there are. I thought, I will, I will eat my hat if these people match each other. And so four people tested. They all had um, ancestry in Limerick. And when the results came back, this was the first set of results. And what you're looking at here really is the, um, all the markers on the chromosome. I like to think this is the Y chromosome lying on its side. And then below each of the markers is the value for each of that marker. And here's the first person. And then the second person uh, was almost an exact match. And then the next three, they were almost exact matches. 11, 11, 11, 25, 25, 25. It's only when you get to these little colored bits out here that there's a minor mutation. So this told us quite clearly that you are all closely genetically related to each other. So it took me three weeks to eat my hat. <laughs> the second lesson was beware of surname spelling. It is misleading. A spearing could very well be related to a spearin. Lesson three, and this was a very important lesson, was you are on the right track. Keep going. Keep researching where you're going. And that is one of the biggest lessons that DNA tells us. It either tells us, yes, you're on the right track, keep going where you're going, or else, no, forget about that, go and research somebody else. Uh, because I was ready to give up on my spirit line, but it's only when I saw that we matched each other that I, I was given the message, keep going, you're on the right track. And um, more people tested, and now we have about 11 uh, people in the group representing nine families from all over the world, Australia, Ontario, Florida, Limerick, Dublin, and everybody matches each other with just a few minor mutations, these colored blocks here on the right-hand side. Um, and uh, everybody goes back to Limerick, 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 Limerick. So lesson four, any spearin or spearing who can trace their ancestry back to Limerick is probably a close genetic match to everyone else in that group. And that's a very, another very important uh, lesson to be learned. So, of course, I'm a Gleason, so my Y DNA goes Gleason, 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 Gleason. So to get to my spearin ancestor, I had to go back up to my great, great, great grandfather, and I had to trace his descendants, all his descendants, looking for a direct male line, where the Y DNA would have passed from father to son to son to son to son. I find it, found it in my cousin, Brian, uh, who did the test, and he came back as a match to everybody else in that genetic family. So what this means, and here is that original diagram again, with uh, my Dublin family added in here, there's me, there's my cousin Brian, we also have two more Ontario families, a Philadelphia family and a Georgia family. Each of them has their own brick wall at this red point here. But it meant that because all of us were, um, because of Hartwell's Spearin, the, some of the families could go back using uh, documentary evidence to these early Limerick families. But because all of us were genetically related to each other, it means that all of us who don't have Hartwell among our ancestors, the hartwell spearin combination among our ancestors, we can piggyback onto the people with the longest genealogy. And that's why if you do the DNA test, you're hoping that you're going to match somebody who has a really long genealogy for your surname, or maybe the family bible that is going to allow you to piggyback on their information and jump back a couple of extra generations in your own family tree. Of course, we still have these missing generations up here for most people. But now the DNA is saying, keep going, you're on the right track, try and find documentary evidence to fill the gaps in the tree. So, uh, can we link to the London Spirans? Remains a question. Um, can we link to the Cambridge Spirans? Remains a question. And can we go back to Flanders? So these are still questions that are even further back in the ancestral tree, but so far, all of us can go back to these early Limerick experiments, these, these wills we discovered earlier on, and we need to fill out these missing generations. We also need to see if we can jump back to London, jump back to Cambridge, and jump back to Flanders. So we started at that stage more intensive research. We set up a website and a blog to document and publish our research as we go along, because you probably all know it goes in one year, and within a couple of weeks, it's gone completely, and then a couple of years later, you come across something and said, oh, did I do this already? Huh. Um, or you're looking through records, and you say, gosh, this looks terribly familiar. 
Um, so it's important to document things as we go along. We've set up a Facebook page and have created a real social aspect to the project. We encourage sharing of information, encourage further recruits. We have a blog as well uh, and a, a formal DNA project with Family Tree DNA. Um, and that's it there. And we've established the project as a one-name study with the Guild of One-Name Studies. So if anybody's interested in doing a surname study, do get in touch with the Guild of One-Name Studies. They've got great resources for you. Um, we did a lot of further documentary search uh, to look at the link to the London experience, the link to the Cambridge experience. Um, there's lots of documentary evidence. There's a lot of trade with Flanders between, uh, the, for the London experience. But there's no DNA descendants identified so far. Ideally, we need somebody who's descended from them to do the DNA test and then prove that there is a connection to the Limerick experience. The same with Cambridge. Lots of documentary evidence. Uh, they did trade with Flanders as well. So there definitely is a strong connection between the, uh, the Spiran name and Flanders. But again, we don't have any DNA descendants identified so far. So we haven't confirmed that. But these are, this is an ongoing quest. Um, also, uh, this, uh, all, there's a lot more to do with the Spiran family if you're interested. And then it's all available on uh, YouTube. Uh, if you Google DNA and family tree research, you'll find that I've put up uh, five 20 minute videos that describe all of this research in a lot more detail. And of course, this uh, video will be available at that address as well DNA and family tree research on YouTube. So, exploring the link to Flanders uh, was quite fun uh, because we used a variety of different um, uh, utilities, facilities, such as surname distribution maps, surname dictionaries, and DNA. I'm going to run through them very quickly because I think you'll find this very interesting if you want to explore the origin of your particular surnames. And uh, worldnames.publicprofiler.org is a very, very useful site. Uh, if you put in the name Spirin, you can see there, there, there are my, there's my cousin Brian, <laughs> right there in in and around Dublin, and there's some Spirins in in London as well. If I add a G onto Spiring, watch what happens to the concentration. Everything moves over to northern Germany, Holland, and Belgium. So there's a, a huge movement. You know, the whole thing moves across. And if I add an S onto Spearings, it still remains around the, the Holland area, maybe southern England, and then Belgium as well, and a bit of northern Germany. Then if I change it from the uh, European spelling to the anglicized spelling, Spear, S-P-E-A-R-I-N-G, watch what happens. Everything moves over to England. So what this is telling us is that we could have German roots or northern European roots, or we could all be from Somerset. And that would be uh, feasible because, of course, a lot of the people who were planted here from England uh, during the plantation of Desmond uh, and the Munster plantation, they would have been from that Somerset area. So we could very well be descended from planter stock from England. So the, the, the distribution maps did not uh, answer anything, but they did give us these tantalizing clues. Now, we also turned to surname dictionaries, and there's a lot of surname dictionaries online. Maglysis didn't have anything in it. Wolf had just a couple of lines, but nothing to really give an indication of where the spirits came from. But, uh, you know, and you have to be careful with surname dictionaries because you don't know, they never really quote their sources, so you can't really rely on how academically robust they are. But, um, from a variety of different online sources, and I've got the um, HTTP e, uh, web addresses there, there was um, one that said that, that Spearin was a German occupational name for a fisherman from Middle Low German, Spearing, denoting a small saltwater fish. Or alternatively, in some instances, the surname may have arisen as a nickname for someone thought to resemble the said fish. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that I've got Spearing cousins in the audience, so in your own time, <laughs> just casually look around the room and see if you can spot anyone who looks like a fish. I've seen two. Um, and there's the fish. There's the fish. And this is a spirit. And uh, it's the Dutch and the German word for smelt. Does anybody know the word smelt? Yeah? Okay. A small trout-like fish that lives in salt water but spawns in fresh water. 
It's called a smelt in England, it's called a spearing in Dutch and German, but on the west coast of Scotland it is called a sparling. Now any of you who have Limerick connections will know that sparling is a Palatine name. And the Palatines were a group of 200 German families that were shipwrecked, I believe, off the coast of Cork and saved by Lord Southall and brought to the Southern estate where he settled them. And the Spearings and the uh, Palatine families intermarried very, very um, avidly. You know, the, the Spearings married Switzers, they married Modlers, they married Ruttle, uh, Teskey. Um, uh, just there's a variety of Palatine names that, that the Spearings interacted with. Is that because the Palatines who were like Sparling recognized Spearing as a Palatine name? And therefore, does that kind of increase the chances that we were actually from Flanders rather than from Somerset? Some fascinating, tantalizing questions arising. Uh, so it's also called Sparling, especially in Scotland, which is a potential variant of Spearing and a name common among the Palatine population of Limerick. So it's from surname dictionaries and from surname distribution maps, you can get some wonderful clues. They may not answer your questions, they may raise more questions than answer them, but it still gives you a fascinating uh, adventure. Now, DNA can also help as well. Um, these are the, the uh, group uh, from Limerick. These are the group that all match each other. But we've tested a variety of different other people, and you can see them here. Uh, we've tested people from uh, England, England, England. Not sure where the origin of these ones are. There's another one with a, a, a ancestry in England. European ancestry here. Uh, Jan Spiernik van Hasevik, 1350 to 1420. Uh, another European here from the Netherlands, and there's an Irish one here. Um, but basically what this tells us that of all of the English and European Spearings and Spearings that we have tested, none of them have matched our family from Limerick. So we cannot say with any definite uh, assertion at this point in time that we do have English or European ancestry on the basis of the DNA testing that has been done so far. What we're hoping for eventually is that either somebody with English roots or somebody with Flemish roots will eventually test and they will be a very close match to the people in the genetic family one we call it, which is the Limerick family. So that's the hope. So DNA testing is continuing. It has not answered the question at this point in time. The other thing that I uh, need to be aware of is this Irish guy here. Uh, his James Sparrow came from uh, Limerick and uh, ended up in Australia, but he doesn't match anybody in the Limerick group. And that's because when he got his results back, he had three matches on his Y-DNA. The first one was Denman, the second one was Denman, and the third one was Denman. So that suggests very strongly that his um, spirit line was, uh, shall we say, interrupted. Uh, somewhere in the not too distant past, and instead of Spiran Y DNA being passed uh, through uh, along his direct male line, the milkman or the postman came in, and it was uh, his name was probably Denman. So he is now searching for his genetic great 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 grandfather to see just exactly if there, uh, if, if he can find documentary evidence of a Denman living near, living beside a spear, and, um, <laughs> and perhaps intervening where he should not. So that's why DNA testing does come with a public health warning. You can, it may reveal illegitimacy, it may reveal a secret adoption. And how do you know that you weren't a secret adoption? Well, it's a secret, so you wouldn't. So um, you could have been switched at birth, as recently was discovered in Canada. Um, half siblings. You might discover half siblings you never knew you had. Uh, so it may give you unexpected answers. It is not for those of a nervous disposition. Um, one of the chief executive officers of one of the big companies, Family Tree DNA, says if you don't like skeletons, don't go opening closets. <laughs> so we talked about uh, SNP testing uh, some time ago. Oh, that's good. I'm OK for time. Um, and um, it shows you how to, uh, about the migration of human beings across uh, the planet. Uh, but we're discovering new SNP markers all the time. These are a particular type of DNA marker. Um, and as a result of these discoveries, we are also able to map where the highest concentration of a particular marker occurs. And so for the Limerick Spirin group, 
Uh, they belong to a haplogroup IM223, and M223 is the marker that marks the end of their particular branch at this point in time. But as we discover more markers, there'll be sub-branches and sub-branches, and our terminal marker will change over time as more markers are discovered. But currently, the terminal marker is M223. The highest concentration of M223 is in and around North Germany, which is consistent with the Flanders origin. Up in Scotland and Northern Ireland, not entirely sure how it got there, is this uh, concentration left over from a previous migration, and also perhaps up in Northern Sweden. So were we Vikings? You know, so then again, it raises questions, but uh, at this level of detail, it's not enough to answer them. But over time, and we are doing further uh, SNP marker testing in the spirit group, um, and we are uh, finding further and further sub-branches that we're on, but over time, we're hoping that it will eventually lead us back to Flanders, or lead us back to England, it might even lead us back up to Sweden. So that is uh, further testing that is ongoing, and because genetic genealogy is such a young science, we are really on the crest of the wave of scientific discovery. And anyone who does a DNA test today or whenever, you will be part of that movement to actually try and find out scientifically where we are from, and maybe more importantly, where are we going? So, so it's a very, very exciting hobby, and it gives a new perspective to things. So if you thought that you'd be getting away from the computer, with DNA testing, you'll never leave it. <laughs> so, that's another health warning as well. The other great thing about it is it's beginning to link us up to some of the ancient Irish genealogies. And we're going to hear some fantastic presentations this afternoon from Cathy Swift and from uh, Elizabeth O'Donoghue Ross on the Munster Irish Project and on DNA testing and clans and people migrating into an out of Ireland, so don't miss that because it'll, it'll shed a little bit more light on this particular topic. And the, the last little bit that we are going to talk about is the reconstruction of Genetic Family 1, which is the Limerick experience. What do we do with those three to four missing generations? What can we actually do? And uh, just to recap, though, there they are up there, and um, DNA can help but also documentary evidence can help as well. And I'm going to run through uh, a few things here. <coughs> These are the actual wills. That's Matthew Spiron from 1718. And then his brother Luke uh, was 1726. And from that we reconstructed that family tree, a very extensive family tree of the early Limerick Spirons, uh, who married into the Hartwell family, granted land, and Charles I, uh, uh, Cromwell, there was a question at one stage, did we come over with Cromwell? How do you handle that in the family? Because not a lot of people would want to know that. Um, but uh, I was able to establish that the Hartwells were very, very fond of Charles I, fought in his armies, and therefore it's highly likely the Spirits married into the, the Hartwells would be very unlikely to be Cromwellian orientated and more likely to be Charles. So, you know, we're with Charles. Um, and uh, we're lucky enough to actually have documentary evidence for two of the ancestral lines. So one line comes down here and ends with Sir Anthony Hartwell, who lives in England, down in, in the home counties. And I've written to him and I'm waiting for a reply to see if he can put me in touch with the family genealogist and maybe get some more information about these, um, these early Limerick experience and their relationship with the Hartwell family. And there's another uh, family in Limerick, the Parker family, who... Um, we do have documentary evidence that links them directly to these early limb experiments. But for most of us, we just have these three to four generations of missing uh, ancestors. So can DNA help? Um, well, on both of these lines, there's a female up there, and that is going to block the transmission of the Y DNA. So testing the Y DNA on either of these families is going to give you Hartwell DNA here, and it's going to give you Parker DNA here. So it's not going to have any um, uh, influence on the Spiron uh, side of the project. Um, there's still three to four missing generations. We are collecting orphan records all the time. We find these individual records. There's a Spiron mentioned here. Where do they fit in? Not sure. Um, and we're putting them all into a sp spreadsheet, and we're still trying to find out how did they get to Limerick in the first place and why. And this is a, a tantalizing scrap of information that we got from um, Sir William Beetham. Uh, and just to uh, skip through this,
but it just gives you an idea of um, that is the, the, the scrap of information that links us to the London Spirans. Because he says here, the Spiran was involved in the visitation of London, and over here it says, Luke Spiran of Kappa, which is just down the road, and his brother, Matthew, were George's sons. So, and, and by doing a whole variety of uh, documentary investigations, there's the translation up there, uh, we came to the, there was the, the visitation of London, and there is George Spearing, married to Rebecca Carter. Um, but by uh, looking at all of this information, we were able to put a lot of information together on the London Spearings, but we weren't able with any degree of real conviction to uh, assert that Beetham's notes were actually correct and that the Limerick experience originated from London. The other day I went into the Earl of Dunraven's estate papers in the University of Limerick Library um, because we're on the Earl of Dunraven's estate practically here. Uh, it was all around it there. And there are some very, very useful documentary, uh, there's documentary papers there that can be useful for genealogical purposes. I went in and uh, my question was, are there any records of the Spirit and family among the Earl of the Ravens estate papers? And it's been a few years before I went into a library and I got the batch of papers and then you open the first one and the waft of the paper and the smell of mold, the smell of mold wafting into your nostrils, you know. And, I, and then the librarian said, actually, it's not the papers, it's you. So, <laughs> so the big question was, could I find anything in these papers. And the first one I opened was the, the transfer of the tithes of Adair from the Reverend from the Vicar of Adair, Reverend Edward Ingram, to Valentine Richard Quinn, whose family later became the Earl of Dunraven. This was the first document, and I read through it, and at the end, this is what I came across. According to ye best of our knowledge, ye something contained in ye two within is a true account of ye glebes, tithes, and dues belonging to the vicarage of Adair, as witness our hands this first day of August, 1697, Henry Winthorne, <coughs> Francis Wide, and in the middle of the last lot of names, Matthew Spearman. I have found my ancestor. I was home. So that was absolutely amazing. This person here, Michael Thomas Hartwell, there was a colon here, and I think that means that there's an abbreviation. So they've actually cut it off. You know, there's more for the, to the actual word, but the colon indicates that the word has been abbreviated. So I'm assuming that that means Matthew, and this could very well be part well. So that's what I found in the Earl of Dunraven's estate papers. Uh, the one name study is still ongoing, and we are still collecting documentary evidence like this. There's still more from the uh, Earl of Dunraven's estate papers I need to collect, but uh, all of this will be put on the website. All of this will be uh, used to reconstruct the branches from the records. Many trees with many brick walls will have to characterize the most distant known ancestor for each of those brick walls. You know, what does a uh, naming convention give us in terms of clues? Can we get, make a guess as to what the parents' names were? Can we make a guess as to perhaps if they had any brothers and sisters based on the baptisms, the sponsors? So there's a lot of documentary evidence that still needs to be done. And um, we're reaching the stage now with the DNA markers that we will be able to use DNA as a substitute for missing people in the tree. So eventually we're going to end up with something like this, starting at the present day with known people and going back in time most people uh, maybe having a brick wall around about 1830, 1800, and then from that point on, the DNA markers will, te will take over. And we hopefully in the next couple of years, will be able to insert DNA markers instead of people. And the, 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 because of the DNA markers, they have a certain time associated with them, we should be able to identify the branching points in the family. So even though we may not be able to identify the person and it may be just a DNA marker that, attempt, that sits there instead, we should be able to know, well, uh, this family here and this family here, they are connected to probably one, two, three, four, five generations above their current most distant known ancestor. So at least we'll be able to have a combined mutation history and family history tree. And that's for the future. So to summarize why DNA unites us all in Limerick, we have a common ancestor. Uh, it helps focus further research, and it stops us giving up. 
It means it says you're on the right track, keep going. It may reveal our surname's origins in time, but we're not there yet. The family tree reconstruction is possible. DNA will help. We're still early days there. New records will help, and there are new records coming online all the time. So our family tree has taken us on a unique and exciting adventure. We never thought we'd look like fish, but apparently we do. And it took us this June to the Spiran Lock Cabin in Barrie, Ontario, built in 1834, lived in by the Spiran family who emigrated from Limerick uh, up until 1962, when Dr. Curtis Spiran, a vet in Barrie, donated it to the Simcoe County Museum. And this June, we met at the log cabin. Here is Dr. Curtis now, age 92, and here are all my eighth and ninth Spiran cousins that I know from Facebook, and we've never met each other before. So this was the Spiran family reunion of, of 2015, and there is still more to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Now we have time for a few uh, questions. Anybody have a question here? Yeah, um, and I looked into having this done a few years ago, and it was a, they, and my name's Holmes, and there's a Holmes project on FTA DNA, and there's um, one branch of the family. But uh, I was trying to persuade him to get tested, that we both get tested, we might be able to prove a link yeah. and exactly what, you, exactly what you're talking about. But um, I'm just interested to know the mechanics of it in terms of um, different companies, because I think what's after happening now is that man is after going off and taking a jump and gone with Ancestry, yeah. as opposed to going with um, what are the, other the, ones, yeah. the other companies, which is what I was thinking of doing. So. Sure. Um, for Y DNA testing specifically, yes. for your surname, um, Family Tree DNA is the only company that does Y DNA testing now. Right. So if you want to specifically look at your father, 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 father line, you have to do it with Family Tree DNA. Uh -huh. There's no other way of doing it. Um, the test with Ancestry is the autosomal, which is all the other chromosomes. Um, and you can get that from Ancestry, you can get it from 23andMe, and you can get it from Family Tree DNA. Each of the companies have their pros and cons. Right. Okay. I personally favour Family Tree DNA because 30% uh, of the database is non-US, compared with only 10% of 23andMe, compared with only about 2% of Ancestry. So I've tested with all three companies. Most of my close matches are with Family Tree DNA because my ancestry is Irish, and there's a greater proportion of kind of Irish uh, people testing with Family Tree DNA than there would be with the other two companies. That is likely to change as Ancestry takes off, but uh, you will get a preponderance of American testes with Ancestry and with 23andMe. Okay? So um, that's the first reason for why I would favor Family Tree DNA. The other reason being that it does have an infrastructure where you can set up your own project. So if you wanted to do uh, your, your homes project, yeah. or you, there's only there, one there way there. Yeah, so um, uh, it was the same with the leasing project. I um, offered to help out with the leasing projects, and I look after the Irish families in the leasing project, and Judy looks after the English families in the leasing project. So um, yeah, so those, that would be the, the option. Um, you can transfer your results from Ancestry to Family Tree DNA, but the Ancestry results will not contain the Y DNA, only the autosomal, which is all the other chromosomes. So he would actually have to test with Family Tree DNA to, uh, to, to see if he's a Holmes, a real Holmes. <laughs> well, it's weird. We're, we're the two families basically traced to the same part of Ireland, quite close to each other, but there's no documentary link between the two families. Exactly, what happened with my spirit as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So, yeah. Great. Other questions? We have questions. Yeah, just, just uh, if your name is Murphy or O'Brien, does that create great difficulty? <laughs> <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> well, it does a little bit. It does a little bit. Um, there's a lot of Murphys that will... Um, O'Briens, uh, well, I think Kathy and, and Elizabeth will have an opinion about the O'Briens because the O'Briens are relatively more uh, localised than the Murphys. Yeah. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, I've got Ryans in my family um, which tend to be all over Ireland, so it's very, very difficult. And something like Farrell, actually, is uh, a very difficult surname because Farrell means the man of valor. And of course, every family had a man of valor, so every family is a Farrell. So it means that there's multiple origins for the Farrell surname. Something like, um, that's a good example. If you've got a fairly rare surname that localizes, like Starkey, let's say Starkey, localizes to a very, very uh, specific area, 
then you can say that more than likely anybody who has the name Starkey probably goes back to, is it, where is it? Galway, anyway. Galway? Galway, okay. We we'll take Galway. We we'll take Galway. Um, so they probably go back to Galway. So that helps you focus your research just looking at surname distribution. And you can use the Irish Times Ancestors website to look at the distribution of your surname within Ireland, and that gives you a clue. If you look for Murphy, though, you know, it could be anywhere. So it does create a problem, but with the Y-DNA testing, what you'd find, uh, if there is a Murphy project on family tree DNA, you might find that there are lots of different genetic families. Uh, so lots of little genetic clusters. People have a particular, with one genetic cluster might be from uh, Mayo, another genetic cluster might be from Wexford, another genetic cluster might be from Kerry. But they're not related at all. They wouldn't be, uh, except thousands of years ago, when man first came into Ireland, which was about 8,000 years ago. So there might be a common ancestor going back 8, 10, 12,000 years ago, but certainly not within the last thousand years since surnames became uh, in general usage in Ireland. But you can be very lucky. You can be very lucky, Cathy. Can I, can I say, in relation to that, John King has a map inside, which is mapping the surname distribution in Ireland in 1893 in the Register of Birth. And it, it gives you the relative size, so it has Murphy's down in the, in, the, in the south, very large, but you have other Murphy's all, all the way. So if you want to find your surname in 1890 in an Irish context, the map is over in the Taylor room, and just have a look at it, it might help. Great. What, um, the, just take that example of the, possibly 12,000 years ago, somebody coming in, a, a common ancestor. I have no idea. At what rate, over time, do mutations happen? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes, that's a, very, that's a very good question. Kathy's laughing because that's the question she had as well. Um, they, it varies. Okay, you can get some uh, markers on your DNA that you take very, very quickly. So even from generation to generation, you might find them flipping forward and backward, forward and backward. And uh, other markers will mutate very, very slowly. Okay, um, the average. They, they looked at SNP markers and they, they, they came out with various estimates. So an estimate for a SNP marker mutation might be 135 years. So once every 135 years, you might get a mutation somewhere in your, your SNP markers. All of these estimates have very large confidence intervals around them. Uh, and I, statisticians and genealogists have difficulty talking to each other in a language that is common to both. And I liken it to the the, the, gene, the statistician that came up to me at a cocktail party and said, oh, you're a genealogist. Um, you'll be pleased to know I've started researching my family tree. And I said, oh, that's great. She said, yeah, I'm starting with my grandfather. I said, oh, when was he born? He said, well, I'm 95% positive that he was, there's a 99% chance that he was born sometime in the last 24 generations. I said, well, I've got a roast from the oven. So. <laughs> so it is difficult for the statisticians to give us what, as genealogists, we would consider a useful piece of information. So those estimates are pretty big. Uh, we have a question back there. Uh, I tested this. Uh, my results come back as haplo predicted haplogroup haplo F. Right. And I think it's subgroup M29. Right. Um, and meaning that the original group came from somewhere in West Africa, around Guinea or somewhere well like that. Well done. But there is no migration path for it anywhere near Ireland. It goes kind of goes straight across and doesn't go up this far north. That's a very very unusual genetic signature that you have. And I'm, um, Elizabeth, do you know where F comes from? That is so rare that I can't really say for sure. But if you know what the discovery is, um, it could very well. Where is that? Yeah. Right. It's the green one in the, in the center. There, right. 
Gosh, well, you, you look like you were part of that exodus out of Africa 50,000 years ago. You're looking great. <laughs> 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 and eventually, we began to look a little, a little bit more like a fish. But, <laughs> but uh, you can see that it, it goes to G, and it kind of stops dead around the button. It doesn't get as far as Spain or... or yeah, that's true. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, you might have a very, very ancient genetic signature that very few people have. When you first mentioned it, I was wondering whether you might have been coming from West Africa. And of course, the West Africans went up and, and they were Moors, so they occupied Spain in the 13, 1400s. And the Moors, of course, and the Spanish traded with the West Coast of Ireland. So maybe we have the occasional little bit of Moorish Y-DNA coming in, but as I like to say, it's, it's very, very rare. I haven't seen any cases of West African DNA appearing among the Galway male population. Well, I, I brought Wexford, and we, we have mobbers in Wexford, I don't know if you've heard of it, but they're, 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 they're very similar to the, the part of the Moorish guys, or the, the Berbers? Uh, they, they do a similar kind of uh, dance. Dervish. Dervish. Oh, Dervish. Mm -hmm. But that was more Turkish, I think, wasn't it? Turkish. 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 But mummers, yes. Okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. There's, and that's the great thing about DNA, is that the more Irish people that test, we get a much better idea of who we actually are and where we've actually come from. Um, and that has a wonderful impact on how you identify yourself and how you, um, so I think that's a fascinating aspect of it from a kind of social, psychological point of view. We have a question here. Is there a lot of genetic um, evidence that the Irish descended from the Basque region of, mm -hmm. um, of Spain up here? Um, yes, there is, and the, um, uh, is that something that you're going to talk about, Elizabeth, or Kathy? Yes, Kathy's going to talk about that this afternoon, <laughs> or, or maybe a little bit, but yes, the, that there is that link there between the Basque and the Irish, um, but like I say, it's early days yet, and as we've discovered more markers, because uh, we only discovered an extra 50,000 markers two years ago. And we're still trying to analyze and gather data on those ones. But as, as time goes on, we're going to get the finer detail is going to become more apparent. That article was only published in 2006, but was it genetically it was back in the primeval age? Question here? Mm -hmm. I'd like to do my white DNA. I'm 45% Irish, and my father's 75. Do okay. I have do I have his? DNA testing, is that better to get back to our Irish roots than mine? If you're doing Y DNA, it doesn't really matter if it's your father or yourself because okay. you will have got uh, your Y DNA from your dad. Um, that's what I assumed when I bought my first Y DNA kit. And I thought, actually, let me give it as, to, as a Christmas father. present to my father yeah. because whatever Y DNA he has will also apply to me. And then I thought, actually, how do I know he's my father? So I threw caution to the wind and I said, Happy birthday. And, and uh, it turned out later on he was, but not with that test. But if you guys think, I was supposing I was smart at that birth or a secret adoption, you wouldn't know. You know no, so right. you do have to kind of uh, tread carefully in the water. But um, for the autosomal DNA test, which looks at all of your ancestors, all of your chromosomes, it's better to test the oldest generation. Uh, first. Okay. Um, but in your case, for example, is your mum still with us by any chance? No. no. So in your case, uh, if, if you tested both yourself and your father, anybody who matches you and your dad is obviously on your paternal side of the family, but anybody who matches you but doesn't match your dad has to be on your mother's side of the family. Okay. So it's a great way of checking your mother's ancestry as well. Got it. Thank you. Another question over here? I'm Gleason. Oh, hello, Gleason. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You won't be able to do a Y DNA because you're a uh, female, but if you have a brother who are a first uh, first cousin, male Gleason, then you can get one of them to do the test. Yeah. Another question? Yes. If you have a very rare, very rare uh, Irish surname, 
uh, and sign up for the Y-DNA test, and there aren't any others with that same surname testing, what can you really hope to gain from that? Um, if there's nobody else in the database, you will be a lone person sitting there waiting for somebody else to take the test. And of course, once you've done the DNA test, you're still going to be in the database. And you'll get, you know, as more people join and they match you, they will be added to your matches page on your website. So you'll get, you know, it can be a waiting game. And over the course of time, you're hoping that more and more people will test and that somebody eventually will match you. Okay. And at the 111 level, is there anything else that you can discover? Um, it depends, the really. Test? I mean, it's a kind of uh, an expensive test sure. to have if you aren't going to have any matches in it. Sure. It's pretty certain so far. Um, well, the standard mm -hmm. test for most that we recommend for surname research is the 37 marker test. Mm -hmm. That would be the one to start off with, and you can get that for $129. Now, um, if you have no matches at that level, you can upgrade from 37 markers to 67 markers, and you may discover that there are people that come out of the woodwork at 67 that were hidden at 37. But like, like you say, it is a little bit, it's about another $100 to do that upgrade. And then to upgrade from 67 to 111 is another $100 on top of that. So you'll end up be spending something like $300, $350 for a 111 marker test. Um, it can be useful in some circumstances, but it's really the luck of the draw. You may reveal a match, you may not, um, and it can be a lot of money to spend just on that kind of hope. Uh, you also can, there's another variety of techniques you can do, uh, which are a little bit technical, but there's a lot of uh, support on Facebook from a variety of different groups like the um, ISOG group, International Society of Genetic Genealogy, on Facebook. Um, so if you just go to Facebook and Google genetic or genealogy, it'll come up. Um, there's my own Genetic Genealogy Ireland Facebook group where you can get some advice and support. There's the YDNA Project Administrators group, which is more for project administrators who administrate these uh, YDNA projects. Um, but there's Ysearch. Uh, Ysearch, you can upload your data for free, and you can possibly tweak some of the more unusual marker values that you have and convert them manually to a more common marker value, and by doing that, you actually might find that you match people that way. So that'll give you a, that's another option that you can do. Are you but, allowed to do that? Oh, you can do it, yes. With Ysearch, you can, you know, it's, it's your own data, so you can manipulate it in any way that you want mm -hmm. to. Um, most people don't, but it can be a useful exercise because it may reveal some close-ish matches to you that you can investigate a little bit further. Sorry? What? The genetic department in Trinity is more involved with ancient DNA. So, like Professor Dan Bradley, he's he's uh, did some research on Nile and Nine hostages and the M two 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 marker in Northwest Ireland a few years ago. He's coming to speak again at uh, Back to Our Past in Dublin in October, and he'll be talking about his ancient DNA research that was recently published this year. So that's uh, uh, Trinity. They don't do this type of commercial testing. I'm going to take one more question, and then I'm going to have to move on to the next talk. I'll take two more questions, then move on to the next talk. Parish. Uh, I have, I, it may be similar to what this man mentioned before. I have a parallel branch of the family that I know through folklore are related. And, and um, so I knew this, and was actually, they're living in the locality still as well, but I have no actual link. Mm -hmm. link. Now, I have uh, soft links. They have actually turned up. I go back four or five generations, they've turned up at witnesses at weddings on my side in numerous occasions. So mm -hmm. the softlings, we mentioned Y, we mentioned AT. They're, they're living in the locality, and I don't want to say hi to I could potentially get some of them to test what type of test would best suit me to try and... Are they same name? Oh, yes. Right, okay, so it's, it's uh, Brown. Brown, Brown, okay. So if they have a male Brown in their family, you could do the Y DNA test, and it should hopefully show that their Browns are genetically related to your Browns through Y DNA. You could also do the autosomal DNA test, and that would give you some estimate, with wide confidence intervals, of the type of cousin they are, second, third, fourth, fifth. And with that information, you should be able to make a best guess on the balance of probabilities 
of where the common ancestor actually sits in your respective trees. Okay, and it so probably is maybe one system. or two generations above your... That's, all, that's where I think it is. That's yeah. almost... Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay. So you've got a, a DNA testing strategy now. Thank you. First step, invite them to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> one last question. I'd, I'd like, it's not a question, but it's just an observation. I'd like to encourage more of those common surnames to test. Um, I'm in the southern. Um, my father tested at the age of 95. Wow. So it's pretty old West Cork DNA, um, and it's got very clear matches to families in America who got their genealogy back to Philip or something there, double thousand. Right. Well, hopefully with um, events like uh, today, where we're doing DNA testing, more people will DNA test. Uh, back to our past, we sold 130 kits last year, 100 kits the year before. We're DNA testing again, back to our past this year, and hopefully get up to about 180. So I think DNA testing is gathering momentum in Ireland, and we're going to get more and more people testing. So I'm going to leave it there. I know some of you probably want to go over to one of the other lectures, but I'm going to continue here with the autosomal DNA. Um, and uh, so if anybody wants to leave them, please, please go ahead. And I'll set up for the next talk in uh, one minute. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>